works for a lovely, uh, lovely lunch. It's beautiful outside. Um, we're going to jump right into it, guys. We got a we got a panel to kick things off this afternoon. John McCarris is going to take us through uh, the notion of attracting an audience for your brand's content. John, if you would. All right. It was lunch, everybody. Beautiful outdoors, breeze, yummy food. Now back into here. Um, we're going to try to keep it moving for you. Thanks for making time. And I'm really excited about this. This is not a new topic, I'm sure, for most of you. Uh, having said that, there's always something to learn because no one has figured out how to make terrific brand content that can actually be successful and find an audience consistently, but we're making some progress. So <clears throat> for those of you who haven't looked at the data lately, uh, $47 billion spent last year on content in, between content acquisition, content marketing, which many of you know is blown up into a whole other side of the business. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and also, you know, funding to agencies and other consultants. So it's a big business. Uh, we've got brands like Taco Bell, who you, some of you may have met, who are uh, building newsrooms that are going to require lots of uh, content creation at a more rapid pace. It's a big debate about how much con content should we be creating um, and with what speed. And I think Chester's going to share a little bit of perspective on that. And then we're going to talk a little bit about upper and mid funnel and some of the things that we're learning and Pixability's got some perspective there. So Rob Champy from, from Pixability. Um, you know, we're not really thinking about that in a really contextual way yet, which is how do we think about awareness in video versus mid-funnel, who's doing it, who's doing it right, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. So um, to my right, your left, Elizabeth Lynn, Senior Marketing Manager, Consumer Products for Intel, uh, develops integrated marketing plans across media, creative, social sponsorships, and events. I'm really excited about what you're going to talk about. Next to Elizabeth, Chris Bruss, uh, VP Brand and Entertainment for Funny or Die. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Two down. Chester C. Um, next to Elizabeth. Um, if you guys were here for Brian Robbins' uh, fireside chat today, you saw a quick video of a film that, he, that Brian and Chester are actually co-producing for the Awesomeness TV network. Um, Chester is flying out to Indonesia after this. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're grateful that he made some time for us. And you know what we're really trying to do here, taking two content creators, one a brand, one a YouTuber, and, and trying to learn a little bit from them. Then we're going to hear from Chris. And then Rob is going to sort of uh, help us with the whole notion of big data and how should we be thinking about this? How do we find audiences using data? And there's some developments there. So what I want to do is just kick it off. We only have a few minutes. Let's go right into video. And if you guys could queue up the first video for Intel, please. I have this condition uh, thing. Every time I wake up, I'm a different person. It's been happening since I can remember. I like to keep track of who I am, who I've been. Wish I had a little bit more hair. I've spent time being thin. I've spent time being fat. I've been pretty and ugly. Look at that. With perfect hair. They say it's what's on the inside that counts. It's kind of hard to count when nobody can see your insides. I'm Leah, by the way. see her again, but she would never see me. So for those who have not seen this, this 
series, which is not the first installment, if you will, in the concept, um, actually swept Khan Awards this, this summer. I was uh, uh, fortunate enough to be part of the, the, the jury for content, and we awarded um, full marks and um, uh, a Grand Prix to the beauty inside. So I want to hear a little bit about this. This is something that is outstanding from a storytelling perspective, a, a major feat in terms of how what Intel stands for was woven into the content. World-class talent, great story all around. W what can you tell us about this? Sure. Uh, you know, at Intel, one of our biggest challenges is we sell something to, that the consumers can't see. They can't even really buy directly. And so it's all, we make the processors that act as the brain that goes inside the computing devices. So how do we create that connection with the consumer with something that they can't see? So as part of that challenge, we partnered up with uh, one of our uh, computer manufacturers, Toshiba, and we launched a film series called Inside Films. And actually, we're in our third iteration. The first uh, film in the series was a thriller starting, uh, starring Emmy Rossum. And it was about how she got kidnapped and trapped in the room, and all she had was her Toshiba um, laptop and an internet connection, and she interacted with uh, Facebook through her character. And then the second film, which is The Beauty Inside, we took that one step, step farther. We thought about how can we get the consumers even more engaged, and this was the very, very first social film where anybody could star in the leading role, and we had people audition a lot of people audition all across the world where, so this is the guy, Alex, who's, uh, who has a condition where his outside changes every day. He wakes up every morning as a different person on the outside, but what's inside is what counts. I mean, he's still the same inside no matter what, but different consumers can audition and star as Alex every day throughout the film, and as you can see, little clips of that. And it was extremely successful. We built a lot, a great following where Alex, also has a Facebook page as a character where he interacted with, with his fans, but then a lot of people came in on the storytelling audition to be Alex. And the film, if you get a chance to watch it, is really, really moving and really introspective about what's inside that counts. And we were fortunate enough to have won 11 um, Con Lion Awards, including three Grand Prix, and we were also very proud that this the film series won a daytime Emmy, which is the first in for a branded content. Uh, and now we're in our third iteration where it's now a comedy. And, and every year we're building upon the audience. Uh, so the first year we have great reception from a press and audience perspective, but every year we're getting more and more in terms of Facebook interactions, social interactions, video views, and we hope to continue this and we think it's really important to tell a compelling story where you can engage the consumer on multiple levels and then have a continuity where they can really come back to this and connect with the brand. So one, one thing that's a clear takeaway for me with this project, we talk a lot about um, digital video being an opportunity to have a two-way conversation. It's a little bit different than a one-way conversation that we're accustomed to maybe on television. And, how you design for that is really hard, which is why a lot of traditional content creators have struggled on the web. But if you take an audience design approach um, and figure out how you can solve for the audience you want to attract in right. the design of the content, and getting um, them this, is, this is the kind of thing that you get, which is super yes. exciting and really hard to do. So congrats. You have one more project that you also want to share, which is a little bit different, right? Yes. Uh, we have another project that we're currently, that's also currently happening, and we're in our second year iteration. Let's show the video, okay. and we'll come back sure. and talk about it. Can we see the second video, guys?
Okay, so a very different project. Although both of these uh, ran for, have run for multiple seasons, is yes, that correct? Yes, Which correct. for those of you who are either brands or have worked with brands, you know how hard it is to get renewals on projects like this. Um, what, what, what's the story behind this project? So this is a program that we partner with MTV Iggy, and, and it's a fully integrated program across TV, video, I mean online video, social, and actual events. So this was something when we launched Ultrabooks last year, we found that we really wanted consumers to experience it. Once they hold it, they really understand what it's all about. And so we wanted to find a way where we could engage with the consumer uh, at a more intimate level. And so we uh, work with MTV to develop this secret concert series of these really, really uh, up and coming acts. The, the band you saw in there is Empire of the Sun, which very, very cool if you guys haven't heard them yet. But uh, them. they, so, so we have a, a series of different, um, different bands and secret concerts where the only way consumers can get into those concerts would be to uh, use social media to win tickets. And every day we have a different social media challenge, which whether it's tweeting on Twitter or snapping a video of yourself on Vine, or uh, we even had a challenge where consumers had to write a song as a tribute to Ultrabook. And we actually got a bunch of submissions of people videos playing a song as a tribute to Ultrabook. So, I mean, the engagement level was through the roof. And, and we were able to also engage with consumers who can't be physically at the concert. So one of the cool technologies uh, we have with our processor is the ability to wirelessly send all videos to your TV. Uh, it's called wireless displays, or WIDI for short. Um, and so we built an app that allow consumers at home to actually watch the concerts, whether live or afterwards, and they can select different camera angles and at any given time and change camera angles at will and send it to their TV to enjoy the video. And if they watch it during the live stream, they actually can beam themselves through their um, uh, PC camera to the event itself. We had a large screen set up at the event where all of the social chatter was on the screen as well as videos of people who are actually watching the live stream so they could feel like they're part of the concert as well. So, so we really took a 360 view and engaged the consumers in multiple different ways so that they feel connected with our brand and our products. So really, really compelling engagement devices on both of those projects. And I'm sure that's driving a lot of audience success. I want to come back to that. Sure. Let's, let's flip over to Chester. So you are the artist in the house here. Um, <laughs> over 1.3 million subscribers and 100 million video views on YouTube over the course of, what, four to five years, 234 Somewhere videos. Yeah. We were talking, uh, and, and by the way, just so that I don't sell him short, um, sold over a half million songs on iTunes, co-founder of Yum Yum F Network, which was one of the heralded YouTube original channel bets mm -hmm. last year with some big YouTube stars, Ryan Higa and Kev Jumba. Mm -hmm. um, you, you're really in it to win it, and you've had a ton of success. But when we were talking about these numbers earlier today, you were like, well, that's vanity. Those are vanity numbers. Like Absolutely. When we're brands and agencies, we get intoxicated by a million subscribers and 100 million views, and we're like, oh, wow, that's, that's the answer. Let's, let's saddle up to Chester. What, what's the real story? Um, yeah, I mean, those num I mean, those numbers don't really mean anything. I, 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 there is a benefit to having a larger subscriber count. I mean, at that point, you're saying, well, at the very least, you can, you can attach that to the fact that your brand has been out there. But that doesn't mean that you can drive traffic or that you have an engaging audience ready to view content and, and, and hopefully react to that content and become a consumer if, you're, if that's the play there. So yeah, those numbers are, are really just, in, a lot of them are inflated and in, in you can't compare those two. I did a test um, once and I thought it was interesting and it kind of reiterates this point. But um, I, my point I was trying to make was that uh, the YouTubers, on average, have more control over their audience than a mainstream star because mainstream stars, we, we tend to, we just want to follow them because we're supposed to. And there's a ton of marketing. And there's more marketing money spent on, uh, in the mainstream world than there is on the actual content. And there's more viewership of that than there is of the content, of the which is a huge uh, perception, uh, you know, 
that there's a flaw there. You, the perception is, is, is so off. We, we think there's so much more viewership around TV shows because we hear about them and we see them. But the content itself being compared is very, very different. Anyway, so the test that I did was I looked at a Twitter, and this was, this was um, maybe a couple years ago. The numbers are very different now, but at the time it was, um, it was Jenna Marbles, who's a top YouTuber, yep. and I forget when, like a Katy Perry type. And it was, it was about 10x in Twitter followers. Katy Perry had, uh, let's just call it 10 million, she had one at the time. And then you look, I tried to find like a, a fairly normal tweet, something that wasn't too funny or anything, just kind of playing the tweet. And the retweets was maybe 1.5x, which means that 10 million Twitter follower account that she has, that's not engaged, active followers. That's just inflated numbers. That's nothing. It's, they're not actually listening and ready to react to that artist. They're not there to support the artist as, as much as people think they are. So I, I thought that was a great little case study that I that I. Uh, so I want to I want to come back to this. Let's see a clip of Chester's oh no. trailer, <laughs> and then we'll come back. Okay. It was a love that couldn't be broken. And who would have thought this OK Cupid thing would actually work? But it was also a battle for honor. Come in. with the most outrageous comedy of the year. Why are you showing so much affection for each other? It's weird. And the songs that defined a generation. Romance. Of badasses. Boom. Chester C. It's me. Chester C. Is this normal for you? Chester C. This is getting weird. And Chester C. Star in Chester C. The Channel. Nice guys finish last. I'm falling. She's colder than cold. Okay, so it helps to be a world class musician and an actor. <laughs> <laughs> lots, of, lot, lot, lots of cards stacking your deck. But let me. But, just, that, but I'm not good at either. I'm not really that good at either of those things. <laughs> I'm being honest here. If, if, the, the way that YouTube works is it, it's personality first talent or content second. It, and it really is, and I'm not being modest or anything. I, 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 you can look at the top echelon of YouTube and, and see that. And that's because it's, people want to support the person, and then if they're okay, if they're good-ish, uh, they're, they're supporting the content. So, so it's a collection of communities and you have to really understand those communities in an intimate way. Absolutely. I, I, the, the behavior of the viewer on, on YouTube is so, so different. And I think that's been the biggest mistake that people make. They don't, they keep trying to think in the old fashioned way with, with, with linear channels and how things have always operated. And just jam that down into the ecosystem that is YouTube, which operates completely differently. So, so what, what should brands be thinking about if they really can't look at, you know, social graph? Mm -hmm. reach and really can't look at your subscribership and by the way mm -hmm. I think YouTube just recently announced that you can in essence start to track your followers by video views regardless of their status subscribership or not if I'm not mistaken I don't know if that's true but that's oh, I'm not sure there's a, there's a few great uh, I think tubular labs or tubular mm -hmm. lets you track some really great analytics uh, so you can really focus on actually who's watching your content yeah. versus who's actually earned a badge by subscribing mm -hmm. or what have you. Um, but but so, so what's your advice to brands and agencies? What, sh what should we be thinking about if we're not looking at this data? Um, <clears throat> so first off, we've seen so many bad cases, studies of, uh, of branded integration, right? Uh, I think one thing that we don't look at, we look at the channels and we think, okay, here's an opportunity to make uh, some advertisement and you plop it right into um, what is normally programming that would be the TV show. But in the TV world, you have ad breaks. It's, you have commercials. And there's an expectation there that, OK, now it's commercial time. That's not the expectation when you're dealing with a YouTuber or a YouTube channel. The expectation is not, it's supposed to be what I'm used to, that entertainment that I'm used to. So when you create that sneaky advertainment and you put it in there, it's got to it's gotta really make sense specific to that channel in a, in a very unique way that, that benefits both the content creator and the brand. So it's, and it really is case by case, because I'm speaking very generally about the space, because every channel is so different. Um, I can say with 
as a, a pretty good general statement that most of the top YouTubers are personalities. And, and, uh, and if you look at what's happening right now, a lot of the, the YouTubers that are just vlogging are growing faster than anyone that are keeping that, that daily posting. And it's because they're retaining the, their audience. And as it's getting so oversaturated, those are the ones that really are interacting and, and engagement is so high. Um, I, I, if I had advice, I mean, if I was to sell something, if I wanted to sell something, and, and, I, and I'm not, not talking about a specific person, uh, as a general rule, I would say product placement is better branding half the time because it's not invasive. Um, but you can choose some great content creators to work with that have built a rapport with their audience um, that allows them to do branded. I think Toby Tobuscus is probably one of the best examples of somebody that has set, a, uh, set up a business that people want to see him sell you something. Like he literally has, he makes a living off of branded entertainment. Um, but Top that doesn't go, that doesn't go yeah. across the board though. And so you have to be careful. Um, so with the other players, I think really people, I think people should take product placement more serious. I think it should be less invasive. And, and you're using that term in a, in a loose way because people get, people have very specific opinions about the term product placement versus other forms well, I, of integration. I, I sure. I, I, what I'm saying is right now we're watching a lot of brands step into the space and be a part of the creative. And it's, th that's not what is going to be the expectation of a viewer of that channel. Um, the, the content creator has always been the writer for, for So every, when we come back, you know, we'll be asking you for some advice to brands on how to work with you then to actually make that successful. Sure. By the way, I, did, I forgot to thank the Maker Studio team, Courtney Holt and those guys for twisting Chester's arm to come down here <laughs> when he's flying across the country tonight for 24 hours, across, across the globe actually. Um, so Chris Bruss, Funny or Die, how many are old enough to remember six years ago when the video Pearl swept the worldwide, the yeah, the landlord the starring Pearl and Pearl McKay. The landlord, right? The, the landlord. landlord. Do you guys, yeah. anybody remember the landlord with Will Ferrell? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was like a that was a big moment when Funny or Die launched, honestly, with a single video, yeah, which was Will Ferrell's, you know, co-producer's daughter, right? Yep, Adam McKay's daughter, Adam Pearl. Adam McKay's daughter. Mm-hmm. And, and that launched, that really put you guys on the map. How many, how many views did, did the landlord get? Right now, it's, I think, around 80 million views and climbing or something like that. So yeah. it's, uh, it was an interesting thing because um, um, at the time, I wasn't working at Funny or Die. I was working at CAA, the talent agency, which sort of helped package that. Yeah. And I remember the day that the site launched, they launched it with that video. And I think it was a very different time six years ago when um, uh, there weren't a lot of uh, there wasn't a lot of online content. There certainly wasn't a lot of celebrities doing weird online content at the time online. <clears throat> and so that was the first video and it sort of, it, it, it crashed the site. I mean, it was, it was pretty remarkable from day one what, what, what happened. I remember our clients, you know, when the term first came up viral, that was the video that everybody was pointing to sure. that kind of <laughs> like reframe the optics and how do we get a bunch of those? Yeah. Right, which you know began a long journey of confusion and misinformation. Right. So, fast forward, what's going on now? How are you guys thinking about how to work with brands? You know, yeah. what are you what are you what are you excited about? Well, it's a very different time now. I mean, I think even just from the editorial non-branded side of things, what has happened is that it's not so uncommon for famous people to do funny things. You've got them going on. Jimmy Kimmel and doing something and that's on YouTube the next day. You certainly have seen it happening at Funny or Die a lot. You've got other uh, publishers out there that are doing it. And so um, I think that um, what was, what the biggest takeaway from The Landlord was that it was something that was, um, it was good content and it was also unexpected. And so I think that's kind of what we're, what we're always trying to do on the editorial side is consistently create content. Like you said, the consistency is important, right? And, uh, and also um, sort of think about those surprises, think about what maybe people aren't expecting. And we port that mindset over into when we work with brands because um, we're never, for the most part, going to be a brand's um, overall year-long campaign, right? When you go to Funny or Die, what you want is something that aligns well with the campaign that you're already doing with your TV creative and your print media and your billboards and everything else, but it should be the thing that 
is unexpected. It should be the thing that takes what your campaign is and maybe just turns it on its ear just a little bit. Because two things. One, that's what our audience is going to be expecting, right? They're going to expect that we're going to have that slightly slanted, unique view on it. And because that's what you're hoping for in an on-demand, online world, is that it can't just be your TV creative. It has to be something that people go, oh, I didn't expect that from that. Or wait, did they actually do that? that that's what we try to do. If YouTube is a collection of, of individual communities that are linked in some way, mm -hmm. it isn't Funny or Die kind of the same way? Like some people have their favorite comedians and or, or would you say that people that follow one comedian tend to have a lot of crossover interests in other talents? And what is that, how does that inform how you think about working with a particular channel or a com particular comedian and a given brand? Right. Is it different talent to talent? Yeah, I think that Funny or Die is not close to YouTube in terms of the way that they've created this um, personality-driven community. Um, if you think about it, if you take away that personality and you have that channel and those people and now you put somebody totally different in there, um, you're not going to have the engagement anymore. People go, no, 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 I liked that person. I liked their point of view. So from, from the beginning, and what was a challenge for us was we obviously had success with Will Ferrell and you think about sort of Zach Galifianakis and some of the other people that were Between doing... Between two firms. Exactly, yeah. That's, so that's year one of the site, right? Yeah. And what was important for us to be able to do was to turn away from that t specific talent and to be able to create a brand of our own, Funny or Die, as a brand. And that way when Will's off doing a movie, which he's doing most of the time, or, um, or even some of our behind the camera talent, our writers and our directors and our producers, go on to SNL or do their own TV shows and all this kind of stuff, the Funny or Die brand can remain consistent. And yeah. so when we think about, uh, so, so that's, the, that, that's when we work with brands, it's sort of, it's a brand aligning with the equity of Funny or Die, which isn't going anywhere. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of working with celebrity talent, certainly we do that as well when a brand wants to work with celebrity talent. And yeah, you just have to think about, is that gonna make sense? Who's the right person? And, and there's a lot of thinking and, that goes And that's into where that. things can get challenging, different talents, different issues, different Absolutely. production partners, et cetera. Absolutely. Before we get to Rob, um, Chester, you mentioned something earlier today about consistency, and we were talking about like, that you're on a little bit of a hiatus right now. Um, yeah. but, but that you were sort of feeling like, you know, in order to be effective as a channel owner, mm -hmm. you, the, the pace of creation is actually increasing it's, significantly. Absolutely. What, what, what's, what, do you, what are your thoughts there? My hiatus is a, is a bad thing. <laughs> I shouldn't be on one. It doesn't exist online. Um, because tweet, tweet, free, tweet free zone. So, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think... Uh, you look at the space, and I mean, I mean in the last three months. I mean, in the last three, six months, it has changed. We, we have been um, paving the way YouTube sort of operates, the content creators have, and, and we've created systems where, okay, on average, most people are posting once a week, and that starts to feel familiar, and that feels okay. But there's so many content creators now, and it's, it's, it's just so oversaturated with so much content, and your eyes are getting pulled in every direction. Everyone's getting better at pulling you in another direction, maybe even off the site. And so, um, because your time is never gonna change, you know, you, you have your time that you're gonna spend wasting on YouTube, that doesn't change, that's fixed. So, so if you spill out of that, that bubble and they replace you and they forget, then they forget. And, it, and so you gotta maintain that relationship. And that's yeah. hard. Consistency is, is, for, is a, a huge part. Particularly for a one-man band. So, so Rob, um, we asked you to, to be here to play a little bit of cleanup Pixability is a really interesting platform. Um, there's a slide I think we want to show really quickly, but before we do that, um, talk to us a little bit about what is it that you guys are doing? We have, we have a lot of brands creating content. Um, how, do you, how do you play in? How should we be thinking about using Pixability? Yes, that, that's a great question, John. We're, I'm probably the only uh, non-content producer here, so, uh, which means we look at a lot of, a lot of content. So as John mentioned, we, we take a big data approach uh, to YouTube. I think all the panelists have said there's a lot of stuff on YouTube. And if you're a brand sitting in the audience, um, getting found on YouTube is going to be almost, almost impossible these days uh, for several reasons. It's, there's just so much out there. And Chester, you talked about personality. Let me ask you, 
the brand people in the room, how many of you can say that my content really has a lot of personality? And I think the most we've seen recently, you've all seen the old Spice Guy, right? How many of you have seen the old Spice Guy? Okay, very compelling. Also, a very socially engaging you know, experience. They did it right. Of course, you know, it's like little kids playing soccer. Everybody wants the next old Spice Guy. So when we look at things, in, what's surprising us is we're looking at where's the audience on YouTube. And you can't go and type www.youtube.com and figure out what your audience is. You've got to crunch a lot of data. But it's not just about audience. You know, the view metric, the view metric is horrible. And there's lots of people out there willing to sell you, you know, ads based on, hey, look, I've got, I've got 100 million views advertised on my channel. And that's not necessarily a smart approach. So you know, what we're looking at is we're looking at all the various metrics in the aggregate to find out where the audience is, but also, surprisingly, what the audience is consuming. And that's a big shock, too. Your audience is probably consuming very different stuff than what you than what you anticipate. And the reason this is so important is you're about to make ad buying decisions, et cetera. And what we see, uh, and, this is, and this is a dig, a lot of you, and we talked at length at this conference about television you know, versus digital video. It's, and we don't see it as one or the other, we see it as both. But please, you know, the content that we measure, when you repurpose that TV, yeah, that 30 second TV spot, and you put it on YouTube, you've just wasted time. So we're analyzing, so we're seeing consumption patterns that are very, very different, and we're seeing audiences that are very, very different. And, and the takeaway is you get to treat your audience very differently, they're consuming it very differently, but if you're making YouTube and digital decisions without looking at data first, You've just wasted a lot of money. So we're almost out of time, and I want to come back to each of you. Before we do that, can we throw that slide up? I want to talk for just a second about you know, upper and mid funnel. Um, what are we seeing here in 30 seconds? Yeah, in 30 seconds, what we saw, and this is actually, we looked at the beauty industry, which is just a fascinating industry on YouTube. For those of you who've seen Hall Video Girls, et cetera, what you see is what the brands are actually putting on YouTube. Now, when you look at what people actually watch, and this includes a lot of the, the celebrities on there. The brands have lost a lot of control. The, the brands who don't want to turn around and relinquish control, they've already lost it. So Hall Video, Michelle, Michelle Fawn, people like that now control the dialogue. And a surprising thing, John, is when we analyze not just the beauty segment, but the overall, we have the top 100 brands that we've analyzed recently. What shocked us is that long form content three to 10 minutes, very frequently outperforms a 30 second slot. And what that represents, it's a deep level of engagement. It really represents a funnel. <coughs> so if you look at your audiences going through a relationship or a funnel phase, the type of content you produce is very, very different. Okay, I'm gonna take four extra minutes of your time. I know we're out of time, but uh, each of you, one quick question, Elizabeth first. What is the one piece of advice you have for brands and agencies trying to play the way you guys are playing with world-class content creation um, and big budgets and commitments? <laughs> uh, I would say integration. For us, it's uh, the ability to integrate across different medium is really important. So it's not just about video, uh, whether it's TV or online. It's really important for us all to have social reach, to have potentially events uh, uh, presence and and maybe even extending it to retail because that's that's actually one of the biggest questions we always have is you know we're out there uh, making connections with our audience on the brands but how do we actually drive them down the purchase line? so 360 degree approach is yes. key to driving audience yes okay Chester uh, you and your friends at maker as you're thinking about brands that you want to work with what's the one piece of advice you hope to be able to give them um, one one piece of advice uh, I, again, I think, I think you have to look at every single content creator differently. I think okay. you, you really have to understand what that content creator is, is making and how their viewers are engaging with them. And then you'll have a better shot at actually turning a viewer into a consumer. Every community is different. Every creator has got a different relationship. Great. Chris, what's, um, the, what's the one single most important thing brands and agencies should remember when engaging in your talents? I think for us it's to, to not take 
uh, yourself too seriously. I think that when we found that brands are able to uh, loosen up a little bit and step into our world. So relinquishing control then? I, yeah, it, a little bit of control. Very hard, very hard for brands to do. Yeah, yeah But exactly. good advice, always worth repeating. Yeah. Rob? Don't approach, don't approach YouTube with the television mentality. I'll approach it with a YouTube mentality. Lay off, you know, lay off creating avatar. Create compelling content that the audience is going to engage with. And the reality, we haven't touched upon it much at the conference, but when you do YouTube right, the results can be absolutely dramatic. Fantastic. I want to thank you guys for being a part of this. Thanks, I assume we're out of time. Out of time, questions? Or do we not have time for questions? I think we're uh, out of time, unfortunately. We're OK, thanks, you guys. It's been a pleasure. Great job. Thank you. Well done.